get started. I see people joining us both on the Zoom um, and on Facebook. Hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Heritage Cafe. Today we have Dr. Tomiko Nomura. Um, <laughs> she is a local Tacoma historian. Uh, she's got a background in literature and American ethnic studies. Um, and in uh, 2014, she started working on the Japanese American story in Tacoma. And she has since organized the annual day of remembrance. Um, let's see here, she's got so many things going on. She just wrote two books. I don't know when she had the time. Uh, she published Rosa Franklin, A Life in Healthcare, Public Service and Social Justice. And We Hereby Refuse, a graphic novel um, on the Japanese American resistance. So a lot of exciting things to talk about. And I know she's been very busy giving talks all week. So we're happy to have her. Um, Let's see here. She's also a writer for History Link, so many of you may have seen her there. And then we also have the illustrious Dr. Bill Barzma, uh, former Tacoma mayor and current president of Tacoma Historical Society. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. So, um, Bill, do you have a few words about Tacoma Historical Society before we throw it to Tamiko? Well, sure. First, we're, we're pleased to be a part of this and be sponsoring this uh, very important talk. I'm looking forward to uh, this with a great deal of uh, interest. Just uh, to let people know, the Tacoma Historical Society's museum is now closed for obvious reasons for the time being, but we have moved to 406 uh, Tacoma Avenue South, not very close to Wright Park. Uh, we have twice the square footage that we had in our prior location on Pacific Avenue. And once we reopen, we, well, we open our doors Wednesday through Saturday. We certainly welcome people to join with us. One of our exhibits that we have, we returned Dreams That Matter, uh, the story of social justice uh, champions in Tacoma and how they contributed to uh, making a, our city a better better place to live. So let's get on with it. I'm interested in hearing our, our guest, uh, our, our premier speaker, I should say. Awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. Tamika, <laughs> we will uh, let you take it from here. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know it's dinner time um, for a lot of folks, crazy uh, time of year. Um, thank you to the uh, City of Tacoma Historic Preservation. Uh, thank you to Histo Tacoma Historical Society and Historic Tacoma. And I think Tacoma Creates, as far as I can tell. Um, thank you all for inviting me to talk. Um, I've been asked to talk about my work documenting Tacoma's Japanese American and African American history. And it's been a great privilege and a little surprising, honestly, for me to be doing this work, which is why I called the talk Falling into Public History. So um, I'd like to show a few images and talk about those and leave some time for questions and answers. Lauren, I'm going to count on you to keep me a little honest as far as time limits go. Um, I'm a former academic and it's an occupational hazard that I talk too much. So sure, uh, please let me know. <laughs> and just for our audience, um, we are taking questions with the Q&A function and we'll read those um, after Tamiko's done. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so yes, I call this uh, talk Falling into Public History. I really came about this work through a roundabout way, um, but I've been really um, honored and um, just really moved by what I've been able to, uh, to document and find. Um, so we're gonna start with, uh, with my roots <laughs> a little bit here. Um, this is just a couple of family snapshots. Um, on the left, in the very center standing is my dad. He's a second, ja second generation Japanese American. He is surrounded by his family. Uh, my grandparents are seated um, in the front, in the middle. Um, I have aunts and uncles uh, surrounding. My cousin is the baby that's being held there. Um, on the right is um, my more immediate family. Um, you can see me smiling in the middle there. Um, my little sister Teruko, who is an artist um, and just moved here to University Place. Uh, my mom is hiding behind a fan. She's Filipina American. And then standing, you'll recognize my dad. Um, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old. And a lot of my work, I think, um, tries to work with Japanese American heritage, history, and culture in um, some ways to stay close to him. Um, 
because my mom is Filipina and my dad is Japanese, I had always had uh, something of a cross-cultural existence. Um, but I also had a sense of really deep roots and history um, and a real deep sense of um, the Japanese American wartime incarceration. Um, the, all the folks uh, pretty much, except for the baby that you see on the left, uh, were incarcerated during World War II um, for being Japanese American. So um, that's my roots. We're gonna flash forward from me as a, as a little kid uh, to where literature and history meet. And this is where I think uh, my urge to do history uh, came from. Um, I went to UC Berkeley, um, which is pictured on the left there. That's Wheeler Hall, where the English department is. Um, I have three degrees, but they're all in English, not in history. Um, and I think a lot of my urge to do history came from this conversation that I had with my honors thesis advisor. So during my senior year at Berkeley, um, I was climbing the four sets of stairs to get to the top of Wheeler Hall there on the left. And I went to see my thesis advisor. And I told him, um, though he did prove my topic months ago, he knew what I was writing about. Um, I had a problem. <laughs> um, I was writing about uh, two third generation Japanese American authors whose families had experienced camp. Um, their book covers are on the right there. That's Shedding Silence by Janice Minikitani. Um, and Ruth Sasaki on the right, uh, The Loom and Other Stories. And I was writing about silence and memory. Um, silence as something tangible that could be broken, um, silence that could speak. And um, it was particularly silence that so many of those who experienced incarceration during the war um, I preserved for decades. Um, my family was not one of these families, but a lot of Japanese American families did not speak about their incarceration uh, for years. It was too shameful, too painful, too traumatic. Um, so when I went to go see my thesis advisor, um, I had I come across this problem. I was writing along, writing along and realized, and I told him this, that I had to include some history. And this really took me uh, by surprise, it takes me by surprise now that I had to include some history and that was a problem. <laughs> um, luckily, I was with one of the thesis advisors who would tell me this. He said, absolutely, you should include some history. Um, but he also said this, and I'll never forget this part. He said, just remember, not everyone in this department would let you do it. And that second part really, really stuck with me. Um, I was so shocked that, you know, I was at Berkeley, which was this, you know, supposedly revolutionary place. Um, there was People's Park just blocks away. Um, you know, students at Berkeley were still, you know, walking around with, you know, recycle or die posters by the student union. And this was, these are the things that drew me towards that campus. Um, so it surprised me that I was in this place where, um, my beloved English department would tell me, might tell me that including some of this history for context would be a problem. So from that conversation, I took away the power of stories, um, the power of stories that have been suppressed for so long. And it also made me think about historiography or the power dynamics in history, right? How history is written. Um, and for the Hamilton fans, I'm going to quote a little bit out there, um, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. So I went on to graduate school, I got my PhD in English, but I also had training in American ethnic studies um, and African American literature and culture, um, which gave me a foundation for studying race in this country, but it also gave me um, a foundation for thinking about the importance of communities that, um, that we study and that we work with. So um, after that, I came down to, after, after uh, graduate school at UW Seattle, I came down to Tacoma. Um, I had a, I'm calling it a bad breakup with academia. <laughs> and I started working in community journalism. So these are just some of the places that I 
started writing for and write for, have written for since. I did book reviews, I did arts writing, I began building a portfolio. Um, one of the first articles that I published um, was called uh, Why Ichiro's Departure Makes This Nikkei Girl Sad, <laughs> back when uh, Ichiro Suzuki left the Mariners for the New York Yankees. Um, Discover Nikkei is a project by the Japanese American National Museum. Um, it's published all over the world in four different languages, um, wherever the Japanese diaspora exists. And um, after writing this article, um, the editors asked me to write a series of articles and they commissioned a series of articles for me, uh, from me and have done so ever since. I think I'm on my seventh or eighth year now of writing for them. Um, I've also written for the International Examiner, which is an Asian American newspaper up in Seattle um, and for the North American Post also located in Seattle. Um, my editors at all three of these places um, basically gave me some of this on-the-job training in community journalism. And it was very similar to my training in American Ethnic Studies. It was go out into the community, meet people, build relationships, document their stories. So from there, in community journalism, um, I was writing for Discover Nikkei and had heard about this memorial that was being dedicated in downtown Tacoma, uh, dedicated to the former Tacoma Japanese language school. Um, the monument or the memorial that you see is on the right hand side there, along with some of the former Japanese language school students in front of it. Um, and it was not, and I've lived in Tacoma at this point um, for about 10 years. We moved here in 2004, and uh, this was 2014 when the, when the memorial was dedicated. And I'd heard about this memorial dedication and the Tacoma Japanese Language School, and this was the first that I'd ever heard of Tacoma's Japanese Language School. And it just blew me away. And I thought, wait, we had a language school? Um, and I had missed being around a lot of other Japanese Americans. And when I went to that memorial dedication, that was the most Japanese Americans in Tacoma that I'd been around in my 10 years living here. In doing some research for the memorial dedication, I came across this map on the left-hand side there. Um, and it is a map, a hand-drawn by journalist Kazuo Ito of Tacoma's former Japan town. And I never knew until then that a map could really break your heart. Um, I started looking really closely at the names that were there, and so many of them were Japanese names. Um, the one, one name that really stood out to me was uh, Uwajimaya, which um, for folks out of the area is a large pan-Asian Japanese American owned grocery store. Um, it started in Tacoma and uh, ended up in Seattle after the war. And I just always think, oh, what would it be like to have an Uwajimaya here? <laughs> um, because a grocery store is really another uh, community center for folks. So um, I looked and looked into that, and, and I started to really understand what the, um, what the first generation Japanese Americans, like my grandparents, had lost. And I wondered just how much was still left and what was still here. Um, seeing that span of, um, of blocks and businesses, I really just wanted to find out more, and I've been trying to find out more ever since. Um, so um, along with that, then, I started to do um, some work on uh, for History Link on Tacoma's Japanese-American uh, neighborhood called Nihonmachi. Um, I uh, did a... Um, I did, uh, Michael, Michael Sullivan and I, um, who might be here, uh, Michael Sullivan and I, who's a local historian, um, started to work together on putting together a day of remembrance again for the city of Tacoma to remember the day that uh, its Japanese Americans were evicted forcibly in May, 1942. Um, and um, along with uh, that neighborhood uh, tour, um, but, but neighborhood, uh, Michael and I started to do walking tours of this neighborhood just to see, uh, to show folks what's left, not much, and to show folks just the scope of what we had lost. 
Um, and so from there, I started to do some work on to, they to become a Buddhist temple. It's pictured on the left here. Uh, Justin Wadland and I uh, co-wrote a history of the temple for History Link. Um, we worked with some of the folks at the temple um, and went through uh, some of the temple archives, which was amazing. Um, together, Michael and I worked for the city of Tacoma Historic Preservation to do some work on the Lorenz Hotel, which is pictured up on the right-hand side. Um, and folks who live in Tacoma will know that it is now a, a micro apartment building across from the University Y downtown, so 17th and Market. Um, the building lost its top three floors in a fire, uh, became a bunch of things, um, but for a little while before all that happened, it was the second home to the Tacoma Buddhist Temple uh, before they constructed that permanent building on the left-hand side. Um, Michael and I discovered that there was a jiu-jitsu studio there, there was a Chinese apothecary there, and it really uh, it opened my eyes as to what could happen in just one place. Um, the uh, bottom right corner there is Dr. George Tanbada, who is uh, administering something to a child there. I did some work for History Link again on Dr. Tanbada and his wife Kimi and their uh, work establishing healthcare um, for minority and low income communities in Tacoma. Um, Dr. Tanbada was a huge force in Tacoma. Um, I believe he's featured in the uh, the Dreams That Matter um, exhibit that uh, Dr. Bardner was mentioning. Um, he founded Pediatrics Northwest and community and community healthcare, along with the, um, some other folks. And um, doing that work really opened my eyes to the history of Tacoma, but also the history of healthcare and the history of healthcare for these kinds of communities. From there. <laughs> And I just kept getting more interested in, in what, uh, what I could do, um, hopefully for History Link. Um, and I, um, my work on Tacoma's Japantown um, had, had gotten some notice. And so I was asked uh, by Willow Tacoma uh, to do a talk on my work with Tacoma's Japantown. Um, so on the left-hand side is um, a presentation that I did. There's a baby picture of me right there um, where um, I was asked to share my story in about 10 minutes of um, how I came to find Tacoma's Japan Town and dive into its history. Um, Willow is this great organization. Um, it's a women's intergenerational living legacy organization. Um, where annually uh, women in the community are invited to come and share their stories in an, a sort of festival storytelling format there. So you can see me, I'm second from the left there. Now, on um, when, the, when the event was over, this happened in October 2019, no, October 2018. Um, when the event was over and I'd finished telling my story about Tacoma's Japan Town and my interest in its history, um, Willow's advisor, um, Senator Rosa Franklin, came up to me and uh, changed my life, <laughs> quite literally. Um, on the right-hand side of the bottom right corner, um, the image there is of uh, this young Japanese-American girl. And right behind her, you can see Senator Franklin and me um, kind of crouched down and she's asking me a question. The question she's asking is, will you send me your resume? <laughs> and I was stunned because really what else do you do when Senator Rosa Franklin asks you for your resume is you send it. So I did and um, she said, I really liked your story and can I forward your resume to the uh, Senate and uh, the Senate, Washington State Senate. And I said, of course, I would be honored. And I said, but why? <laughs> and she said, um, well, the Washington State Legislature does this oral history program and um, send your resume to Brad Hendrickson. He's the secretary of the Senate and um, he'll be expecting you. So I sent my resume to Brad Hendrickson 
And I wrote back and said, so um, could I ask again what this whole program is for? And he said, well, Senator Franklin is too modest to say this, but she is the next person that we have selected to be featured in the Washington State Legislature Oral History Program. And this is how I came to realize that Senator Franklin was asking me to be her biographer. <laughs> um, and I was floored and overwhelmed and honored. Um, we met um, on election day, uh, November 2018, um, for two hours uh, just to establish rapport, find out a bit more about each other. Um, and by the end of that meeting, I'd honestly fallen a little bit in love, <laughs> right, with Senator Franklin and her story and what she had to share. Um, and after that, I had about six to eight months to conduct her oral history interviews and to write her biography. Um, the result of those six to eight months is at the top right hand corner of your screen. And it's my very first book. Um, and we, I called it Rosa Franklin, A Life in Healthcare, Public Service, and Social Justice. Um, for those who don't know Senator Franklin, um, she had an amazing 42-year career in healthcare, all kinds of healthcare. She was a cadet nurse at the end of World War II, lived in Germany for a while, lived in New York for a while, um, and eventually moved to Tacoma a couple of times, the second time stuck, and um, she spent uh, time working at um, a couple of the, uh, several healthcare facilities in the area, and then spent 20 years in the Washington State Legislature. And she was the first African-American woman to be elected to the Washington State Senate. So, um, <laughs> I, I was really amazed to be able to work with Senator Franklin. Um, I interviewed uh, Dr. Barzma for that book. And so some of his words appear in that book, um, for which I'm very grateful because Senator Franklin is very modest and didn't really like to talk about her accomplishments all that much. Um, the other thing I wanna say just quickly about this book is that um, Senator Franklin knew this was my first book. And that somehow did not seem to phase her. Um, and when I had asked her about how she chose her campaign team and when she was running for office, she said that she wanted to pick people who would not normally be picked. And she wanted them to come along and learn in the process. And so I feel that uh, her choosing me was part of that process. And it's really part of an African-American aesthetic, um, which is, really known as Lift As You Climb. Um, the Colored Women's Clubs in the 1920s used that kind of uh, motto and statement. And I recognized that move, Senator Franklin choosing me as a Lift As You Climb move. And I've just been really um, honored to be doing that work for her. So um, just a really quick little bit about my next project, um, which is coming out in February, 2021. Um, it's a graphic novel, and it is co-written with uh, Frank Abe, who is standing in the middle of the uh, man on the right-hand side of your picture there. Um, the illustrators are Matt Sasaki and Ross Ishikawa um, from Left to Right. Um, and it is a co-written graphic novel. It'll be published by Chin Music Press and the Wing Live Asian Museum. The book itself is about the Japanese American resistance to wartime incarceration. And it's not a story that is widely known. And it's not a story that is widely um, really distributed or publicized or honored in some corners by the Japanese American community. So uh, we're going against the grain here in certain ways, but in others, I think folks will find these stories very powerful and moving. Um, we focus on three main characters, understanding that these are real people. Um, three main characters. Um, the first one is Jim Akutsu from Seattle, um, who was pictured in the cover image on the left-hand side there. Um, Jim uh, was um, 
basically uh, try, he tried to enroll and but was refused in the uh, military but was refused a couple of times. Um, and from Minidoka, he uh, resisted when the government tried to draft the young second generation Japanese American men into the army. Um, he argued that his status had been changed to enemy alien and therefore he could not be asked to serve in the military. The second main character is Mitsuya Endo from Sacramento. Um, her uh, decision to be um, named in a Supreme Court, in, in a court case, um, that went all the way to the Supreme Court um, basically resulted in a number of things, including the closure of the camps for everyone. Um, her story is not widely known. Um, people are more familiar with um, Minoru Yasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu. Um, but Endo's case was the only one which succeeded at the High Court, and she won unanimously. Um, at the bottom right there is Tule Lake, where my dad and his family were incarcerated during World War II. Um, the other thing that we talk about in the graphic novel is the long um, and complicated history of resistance and dissidence at Tule Lake. It's known as kind of the troublemaker camp, but we try to provide more context and uh, reframe uh, what, what's known as the narrative of disloyalty for Tilly Lake. So um, the last thing I just wanna talk about here. Um, so the, the things that I've learned um, here, there's just a picture of me and Senator Franklin there. Um, some things that I've learned. Um, first of all, I've learned that there's a real hunger for public history in our area. And I had not really expected it. Um, there's a passion for learning the story, the place, uh, the objects, the moments made accessible. Um, and so people keep uh, writing to me about uh, Tacoma's Japanese American neighborhood, partly because they are looking for their family roots. A lot of Tacoma's Japanese American folks moved away after the war and did not come back. And um, their descendants are now trying to trace um, where they were or where their families were in Tacoma. Um, and the walking tours that Michael and I have done have been really popular. Um, the first one we did, we thought maybe there'll be 25 people, um, 90 people showed up. <laughs> um, the second and third tours had close to 250 people. Um, there's a lot for folks to learn and, uh, and to be made aware of, and they're really excited about it. Um, the second thing that I've learned is that there is a need for public history by and about people of color. Uh, we need not to, we need to not only see ourselves in the history that's being written, but that we also need to see ourselves as the authors of that history. Um, when Senator Franklin was chosen as this, um, as part of this program to be featured um, in the legislative oral history program, she was the first person of color to be featured. And by choosing me, she made me, I believe, the first person of color historian <laughs> to be writing this work. So, um, you know, this is 2020. Um, this happened in 2018, 2019. Um, I really hope that um, more folks can be interested in writing um, this history. And the third thing that I wanted to mention is that I think that historic preservation and American ethnic studies can actually work together and the preservation efforts might look different. So I was thinking about, for example, um, the Design the Hill uh, campaign um, organized by Fab Five in the Hilltop in Tacoma. Um, people who are involving the populations there and the stories there and that there are some efforts to preserve. Um, I've heard Nettie Asbury's house in the hilltop. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, the Puyallup tribe who's been putting out videos and resources for those of us who want to learn more and to uh, think about that history. Um, I think that how we see ourselves in history now has to be a textured, sedimented, multivocal view of who we have been 
And so I'm very excited to be a part of these conversations and very excited to be a part of this lecture series. Um, and I look forward to conversations and questions. So here's my email address here real quickly and I can um, add that in the chat if people want to uh, ask more. Um, and I will uh, leave the presentation now and come back and hopefully we can have some conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Tamika. That was great. Uh, with some very powerful takeaways that I'm glad you mentioned. I think we're in a real moment uh, where we're going to be seeing history done differently and done by different people. You know, the BIPOC community, um, I think we're going to see more uh, bottom up and grassroots efforts coming in and a lot less of this sort of like canon of history. <laughs> and by canon, I kind of mean, you know, <laughs> your standard history that you you think of. Um, so I'm really excited that you're doing what you're doing. And I really, um, you know, hope to inspire with your talk and your work, more people to do this. We need more voices. We need more stories. Uh, we need to hear, you know, I hear a lot that, well, we want to stick to the true history. And it's like, this is the true history. What you've been hearing before history. was not the true history. <laughs> um, so I also want to yeah. open it up to Q&A. People can use the chat or type it in to the Q&A function if you're on Zoom. I'll invite uh, Dr. Barzma back to join the conversation. And I forgot to say that I am Lauren Hukamer, who's the Assistant <laughs> Preservation <laughs> Officer with the City of Tacoma. And uh, this talk is sponsored by the City of Tacoma, Historic Tacoma, Tacoma Historical Society, and Tacoma Creates. If you want more information on our events, you can visit cityoftacoma.org slash historic preservation or the Tacoma Historic Preservation page. Um, you can also put your questions for Tamiko or me in, your, in the chat or in the Q&A, so I open it up for discussion. See, from the Facebook page, we have someone saying, thank you. That was very interesting. Oh, thank you. So, uh, I saw a hand raised, but I don't know what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> Please uh, use the chat if you do have a question. So Tamika, are you planning to work on any other communities? I know you've been doing a lot with Japanese American and African American. Um, one thing that I've struggled with in Tacoma is finding any documentation on different communities. For example, um, the history of the LGBTQ community, the history of the Latino community is starting a little bit with oral history um, and the yeah. UWC oral history project, but it's really hard to find. It's so hard. <laughs> it's hard to find. Um, at the moment, I have a lot going on. And so I haven't, I'm not expanding a whole lot. <laughs> um, I just finished um, a short biography of Bob Mizukami, who is the second mayor of Fife. Um, and that's up on History Link now. Um, I have, um, let's see, uh, on tap, um, I will be probably working with the Washington State Historical Society on a project um, for Japanese American history. And let's see, what is the other thing? Oh yes, I have a, I have a third book <laughs> yeah. um, in progress that I've been working on um, and it's the memoir and uh, I'll just share a little bit about it. It's called Pilgrimage mm -hmm. and it's about uh, Japanese American grief across generations. Wow, that sounds very so, powerful. Thank you. So yeah, busy, that, very yes, busy. Um, um, so I have some questions <laughs> coming in. Yeah, so oh, one, great. From Jessica Spring, who people may know, oh, is your Jessica. book available at King's Jessica. and is it signed? Um, what was the question? Is your book available at King's Bookstore and is it signed? Okay, so the first book um, about Senator Franklin is available at King's um, and I did sign those copies. Thank you, Sweet Pea, for ordering those. Um, and uh, the second book called We, Hi we Hereby Refuse is in production as we speak. Um, it's making its way to the printer in the next few days and it'll be out February, 2021. And um, Sweet Pea has um, graciously allowed, uh, agreed to do something, um, some kind of event for us uh, in the spring, but we haven't figured all of that out yet. Um, so to be continued. Maybe you'll get an, like an anime movie like Persepolis did for the, for the uh, Iranian American community. <laughs> yeah, there um, is an animated short actually that the Seattle channel is doing of uh, Jim Akutsu's story, the Seattle uh, characters oh, based thank story. You. So that will be out um, eventually. <laughs> um, and there'll be a curriculum guide for it as well. 
Awesome. Uh, we have another question. Um, part of this that you answered, um, while it may be too soon to inquire, do you have any more books planned, any more biographies, any more children's books, any <laughs> more graphic novels? So basically, do you have an empire oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, so the, yes, the, the, the first book that I, that I want to finish is the memoir. Um, I've been working on it honestly for about close to 10 years. And it's one of those books that I really, um, uh, would like to finish. Um, I would love to write a children's book. Um, so I think that's in the works eventually, but I'm not sure, uh, just yet what that might be. Um, Mitsuya Endo's story is so powerful and I would love to do something um, for younger, even younger kids, like a picture book um, mm -hmm. about her story. Um, her story really moves me because she was so young and, and also so scared, <laughs> yet she really um, had it in her to make the decisions that she wanted to make. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and that, that courage uh, led to a, a really huge consequence for, for folks. I think it'd be really important to get these stories into younger hands. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so another question, did okay. your parents expose you to a lot of Japanese culture, language, and food? What about your Filipino side and how did you balance this multicultural? Ah. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, on both sides. Um, my mom came from the Philippines when she was pretty young, also around 10. Um, and so, um, and she wasn't able ever really to go back to the Philippines for a lot of reasons. Um, but I grew up with, with um, Filipino culture and food, um, but to a lesser extent, my Japanese American family in, in the United States is uh, more extended as you saw. So I have a lot of aunts and uncles, but also cousins. Um, every New Year's, uh, my family would get together um, and did so for decades, um, as long as I was alive, I've <laughs> been alive, um, and did a potluck for New Year's. Epic, epic potlucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I grew up going to festivals, um, the Cherry Blossom Festival in San Francisco, but also the uh, Obon Festival. Um, we have one here in Tacoma, but it's a kind of our version of Day of the Dead, um, where we uh, try to uh, celebrate and um, and uh, honor the spirits of the ancestors who have come back that day to visit us. Um, but, you know, as far as negotiations between the two go, you know, they're really different, right? Japanese American, Filipino American culture, <laughs> they're really different. Um, certainly don't always get along. <laughs> um, have very different histories of being um, kind of integrated and accepted into the United States. Um, mainstream culture. Um, so, and because I, my first name and my last name are Japanese American, um, I think that in some ways I was able to um, really go into Japanese American communities with a little more ease, right, than with mm. um, Filipino American communities. Um, it's an ongoing negotiation though, right? Um, I also have way, way back uh, somewhere in my to write books, I would love to write a book um, about my mom's experience being Filipino American. Very nice. I like that you said, um, I found it interesting that you said that it was easier to kind of blend into Japanese American um, culture from what you look, because we talk about in, in multiculturalism, we talk a lot about passing and, and how and who's like the gatekeeper to cultural access. I mixed myself. My parent, my mom is from Trinidad and my dad is from Mexico. And I work with the Hoffa community. So I always find that so interesting of how people navigate between um, these sort of dual identities. Uh, we do have another question here for both oh. Bill and Tamiko. Okay. Uh, how does local history matter and what does it do for the community? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been talking a lot, so let's Bill take that. <laughs> let's let Bill take that one first. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's a broad question, but I, I want to kind of circle back to observations that were made earlier in our conversation. That is, um, I think Lauren commented about um, uh, the importance of understanding the history of the LGBTQ community. And what I found interesting in doing the research on our book, Speaking Out, 21 of Tacoma's Social Justice and Civil Rights Champions, one of the most important figures in that whole effort was Perry Watkins, a Tacoma guy who was stationed out at Fort Lewis, a graduate of the Tacoma school system. When I reached out to the community and said, are you gonna be recognizing Perry Watkins? The response was, who is he? And he's one of the most important figures in the history of the, of the movement. 
And so I think, you know, this, this contest, this, it's, even, it's important to understand the figures of the past, the social justice champions, the people who made a difference, people such as Perry Watkins, uh, Sergeant Watkins and his efforts, uh, which went all the way to the US Supreme Court, I might know. And the fact that people have forgotten him and the important role he, he's played, I think we have to circle back and, and, uh, and let them know. The other thing is uh, when I was doing the research on my dissertation, I was focusing on the, the conflict and the polarization in the community over the former government. That was my, my interest. And I thought, well, you know, I could kind of, you know, put uh, kind of kind of bookends around what was happening in the 1950s. But as I began to explore that whole story, it led me back to the 1890s. I mean, that's how far back context and the storyline reaches. So it's important to really understand the broad context of history. Why are we here? And what were the, the important events that kind of shaped the character of Tacoma? The exclusion of the Chinese in 1880. We've never gotten over that. It's been a black mark in our, 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 uh, our history. The fact that the Japanese were able to survive because they dressed as Westerners, they had haircuts, you know, that were, were, that were Western, uh, while the, the Chinese, of course, were in formal, were in formal spoke Mandarin, or Cantonese, actually, and, uh, and kind of separated themselves from the community, I think was, was a story as to how one community was excluded and the other community was able to, to thrive and actually became, as you know, the largest um, minority community in the, in the city of Tacoma during World War I. And then of course, what happened uh, in World War II and the role that the Tacoma mayor played in, in speaking out, Harry P. Kane, who had, who had all sorts of flaws. <laughs> uh, needless to say, if you read his, his history, and by the way, that's a, there's a great biography of Harry P. Kane written by Mark Smith. Raising oh, Cain, which I would recommend to anybody who wants to understand a little bit of Tacoma's history as well. So it really is important to understand how we got here, the broader context, the people, the issues, and how they were resolved, and why we are the way we are today. And the only way to understand that is to go back and to and and and, and really the, the antipathy between the two cities, the big cities of the north and Tacoma, traces back to the Northern Pacific's decision to, to site Commencement Bay, which became New Tacoma as a terminus of the Intercontinental Railroad and not the big city to the north, which was the antipathy, antipathy and, and, the, and the reaction and the tension between the two communities started back then. So uh, I think just understanding that history in that context is really important to understand why we are the way we are today. Thank you. I, I would just add maybe a little bit, Lauren, about that, you know, local history is something that we don't get to cover very often, I feel, in schools. Like I grew up yep. in um, in Northern California yep. and I did not know for ages that it was the home of, you know, the, the ancestral home of the Maidu tribe. <laughs> um, you know, that, that whole context, right? Uh, even when we were studying California history was something that I really just did not realize. And so, um, you know, when I was talking and just, just beginning my whole Tacoma Japanese American history uh, journey, I was talking to um, my, uh, my, my friend Carrie, who, uh, who does my hair, um, downtown in Tacoma, and I was, she said, what are you working on? I said, oh, I, I'm working on, you know, this thing about Tacoma Mr. Pantown, and she said, what? <laughs> I said, yes, I, we had a Japan town. And she said, I grew up here. I had no idea. And she was born in the 60s, um, right? So this is, you know, well after, um, you know, Japan town would have been around. And, but still, like, because there was so little left, right? And um, mm -hmm. the folks who did come back, I just give so much respect to who were able to come back, establish themselves and survive. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of like local local history um, in the schools, and I would yeah. really love for more of that to um, for more people to be interested in it. But you know, like, like I said, there there is an interest. I think there's just some kind of there's some gaps, right? Yeah. That there's I would love to see more people going to the State History Museum, which is in Tacoma, and also to the Tacoma Historical Society, just really to know more about our particular place. Just a kind of a to, to, to build on that a bit, a couple of years back, uh, State Senator Ann Zeiger of the 25th District uh, called me and asked if I'd be willing to come to Olympia to say a few words about the importance of including, including the words local history, not as a, <laughs> as a mandatory subject, but just to refer to them in the legislation. And I actually could not get into the hearing room 
but found out that because he was a Republican and the Democrats, I have to be a Democrat, and Democrats were in control, he just kind of slept them off. And uh, his, his uh, amendment to include the words, consider local history, not to mandate, to, were essentially not I considered by the committee it. and not brought forward. It became a partisan issue, sadly. <laughs> but you know, and that I, I thought, gosh, that, that's a slam dunk. What's, what, what the heck is controversial about including the words, consider local yeah. history? Oh local history. Like, very, really? very frustrating. Yeah, for sure. And but I, you know, like I said, I feel like there's there isn't there's a hunger for it, right? You see just yeah. how well the history stuff does here in Tacoma for local stuff. So, you know, can we also get that enthusiasm and the space for it in the curriculum in schools? And I think right. when you go down to local history level, more younger people are going to be interested because you're really telling the story about their community, you know, their lives, people they know, places they know. It's not this big kind of abstract something happened a long time ago, far away. Um, so I think that really makes it personal as well. Yeah, um, I hope so. We do have a question from mom, somebody's mom, not sure who's mom. <laughs> it uh, might be my mom. It might be your mom. How many years did it take for your family to open up about the incarceration? You mentioned it was shameful for them to discuss it. Oh, let's see. Um, so my family actually did talk about camp. Um, a lot of families did not, but I remember as a child hearing little bits about it here and there, um, just at our family gatherings and things. Um, my uncle, um, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, um, who's the third character we talk about, oh my goodness, in a graphic novel. Um, the third character um, is, uh, is my uncle Hiroshi Kashiwagi, and he actually talked about it a lot. He was one of the very first Nisei uh, to cover uh, and really talk about his experiences in camp. Um, and I have this unpublished manuscript that my dad wrote about his time, yeah, <laughs> um, being incarcerated as a young boy. He was 10 through 14. Are you um, so yeah that manuscript? This is part of the project of that that memoir that I mentioned. So I want to work with it and do something with it to um, really, as I said, make it a, a book that is about grief across generations. So we had some questions about if this talk will be available later. Yes, it will be on the Historic Tacoma YouTube, the Tacoma Historical Society's YouTube and the Tacoma Historic Preservation Facebook page. Oh my so gosh. We'll be able to <laughs> hear these words of wisdom later as well. Oh, wow. So, um, I'm just checking our all our links and I don't see any other questions. Oh, I spoke too soon. There's a question. <laughs> oh, two. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little more about the role historic preservation can play going forward um, with public history? I'll let either of you take that one. <laughs> That's a very big deal. That is a very big deal. Yeah, we've lost so much of our history by the by the wrecking ball, and there have been really close calls. Um, I, when I was back working in, for the governor's office way back many years ago, um, the Union Station was a wrecking ball away from oblivion. Right. And there was some citizens who came together to save our station, to uh, to organize the community. Uh, to, to make a real effort to save that. And if it weren't through the, to the efforts of uh, Senator, uh, Governor Gardner to begin with, and State Senator Ken Matson at the state level that helped uh, stabilize the building, and then Norm Dix to the rescue, uh, that building would have been lost forever. And there are others, close calls. Uh, and then there are some, you know, not only close calls, but, but disasters. Uh, the great municipal dock. Uh, which is a treasure for the for the city. A long history about how that was built and and the role that it played. And through benign neglect on the part of the city, uh, that structure was lost forever. How sad. Um, Albers there's Mill. The, there's the Tacoma Japanese Language School, right? <laughs> that too. Thank you. And and add that to the to the list. And of course, Albers Mill, which was the last remaining you know story of what was on the on the city waterway later the Thea Foss waterway uh, that was a, a, again a wrecking wrecking ball away from oblivion that took the, the efforts of Sandra Purcell and and she rallied the, the cause and and the Murray Morgan Bridge um, which I take some credit for as a mayor became a top priority for me to preserve that that link to the Puyallup Peninsula 
There's so many, you know, grand homes that have become parking lots. So believe it or not, behind churches, I can think of one. Okay. By the way, we 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 do, of course, each year. We couldn't do it this year. We have they they tour of historic homes, and give people some sense of what how people lived back in the 1880s and the 1890s. That's something. That's a gift that we we share with the citizens of Tacoma. Uh, those homes that remain. So, uh, and historic preservation extremely important. And I give credit to the city and, and the commitment uh, that the city has made and some of our past council members, uh, Bob Evans and Bill Evans, both same last names, but both, neither one, they weren't related, but they were related in the sense of their commitment to historic preservation. Those champions in the past really made a difference. And so it's very important. I'd like I to feel... take it even broader too. I recently attended the, um, the National Historic Preservation Conference and it was so great to see the level of diversity there. When I attended my first one 10 years ago, I think there was like three black people, you know? Ooh. And so to see the level of diversity that where, where it's grown to, and also to see all of the topics really talking about anti-racism, decolonization, uh, commemorating Native American cultural spaces. I think the conversation is finally changing um, all through the field, not just sort of in the grassroots, because it always has been there in the grassroots, but really changing all through the field to include, um, you know, not just these grand state buildings, you know, but to really look at our third places, the places where people uh, live, work, communicate, things, places that were important to, um, you know, immigrant communities, women's history, children's history, LGBTQ. I think we're seeing a lot more of that and a lot more um, shift away from only focusing on big civic buildings and mansions, which are great. I love me some mansions, <laughs> you know? but really telling that, that, that tell the story of um, all of our different communities and our different right. um, diversity. So I'm excited to see that in the field of preservation. Yeah, I, I, feel like, I feel like, you know, historic preservation has this sort of veneer, right, of, you know, it's about this kind of stodginess, but, you know, forgive me, Lauren, yeah. but, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it isn't, it isn't quite adequate to me to what it actually is, which is, it could be very exciting, right, about really looking at the diversity of not just the peoples, but the stories across all these communities and lines, right, um, and that, it really, you know, it, it could it look it could look more than what I think people think of when they think of historic preservation, right? Um, you know, if you had told me, you know, six years ago that I would be doing any kind of work in historic preservation, I would have just said, really. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, that as I've as I've done these kinds of deep dives into stories of places, people, buildings, I've become really excited, and I think there is an, an enthusiasm, as I kept saying, for what that is. So I think you kind of harness the energy of public history, right, mm -hmm. um, and kind of marry it hopefully to the resources, right, and the leverage that historic preservation has, um, and that can be um, hopefully very powerful. Absolutely. I've always felt that somewhere along the road we forgot the why of historic preservation and we started focusing <laughs> only on the buildings, which some are great, you know, and deserve recognition just yeah. for how they look, but we forgot like why are they important? What does it mean for our community? Who are the people behind this building? Uh, yeah. it's just talking about just tying those two together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I want to give a shout out really quickly to Claudia and Kiyama, who uh, did some fantastic work for the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation and did this huge project on Latinos in Eastern Washington. Um, and it was a, and it's available on um, the website revisitwa.org. Um, and, um, you know, historic preservation in that project looked like, you know, I think places like a gas station, right, or a community center, right, it didn't look like necessarily always the kind of, you know, <coughs> marble mansions, right, that we might be used to thinking about when we think about historic preservation. Um, so I did some work for the Trust, too, on Japanese American farms on Vashon Island, um, which, again, looked very different <laughs> than what I would have expected to think of for historic preservation. Um, that's also up on revisitwa.org. Absolutely. I think something we forget sometimes is cultural landscapes can be historic preservation and so can agricultural yeah. places. Yes. Um, earlier this year, I think, I can't remember what year we're in anymore <laughs> and how long we've been in 2020, <laughs> but earlier we were yeah. <laughs> on community gardens in Tacoma and how they preserve um, this immigrant history of gardening 
from the oh. communities that they represent. So, um, so yeah, I think it can be much more um, than just you know just fancy buildings. Right. And maybe, you know, we love fancy buildings, but I feel Absolutely. like there's just, there's just so much more, right? There's like this tip of the iceberg stuff. Absolutely. Um, so we have reached our hour. I don't see any other questions coming in, but thank you to everyone who put in a question and helped with our discussion. Any, any final words to make over Bill? Uh, just, it was a very enlightening uh, conversation uh, this evening. I appreciated it. Took a lot of notes for my, <laughs> my, my records here. Thank you so much, by the way, for telling your story. It's very important. Great. Appreciate thank it. you so much, Bill. And thank you so much for helping with Senator Franklin's book. It was just okay. invaluable. Well, thank you both. Thank you to Miko for telling your story, for thank sharing you. it um, in all these places, for the books that you're writing and trying to inspire um, new BIPOC authors. Uh, everybody, look out for her book. You posted the links, <laughs> I believe, in the chat. If that's correct, right? Yeah, they should be up there. Great, and so we're um, I can post I can post those up on the Facebook uh, feed too, Lauren, so people can yeah. have something to, to click back to. Please do, and they're both going to be available at Kings. Is that correct? That's right. Thank Great you, Sweet too. Pete. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Lauren. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.